I am recording. I can't. Hello, everybody. Welcome to the very first, the maiden voyage. And it's always Dan. <laughs> the maiden voyage of the patron series of interviews um, by Kara St. Louis. And um, I think this is going to be a marvelous conversation. That's really all I'm interested in is these magical, marvelous conversations with people who, whom I consider to be magicians. Dan is down in Byron Bay right now. So it's evening there. It's morning where I am in London. He's got a fantastic um, bio. I want to read that right now, but I have to go back to where I have to go back to where I can see it. And I will. Two seconds. Here we go. Dan. Dan Schreiber, mag magician. <laughs> okay, I am. But it's true. He his bio says this: creative director of Starseed Gardens since 2005. Gardener, visionary, he put gardener first, by the way, which I find interesting. Visionary, father, super important as far as I'm concerned. Inspirational storyteller, speaker, and lecturer. His most recent direction is exploring systems of perpetual renewal and designing human interfaces to enable harmonic human communication, relationship, and custodianship of the natural world. Dan is a professional photographer, videographer, and multimedia producer. He is a self-taught herbal healer, ecologist, and landscape gardener with a forte for creative direction and vision. His work with organic plant growth enhancers is on the cutting edge of increasing plant and soil biota health to support the flowering of human awareness via vibrational nutrition. Oh, I want to talk about that. He was there for the very storm-tossed maiden voyage of the Fay Lecture. And he's the guest on the Maiden Voyage today. Dan, welcome. Thank you for being here. Such an amazing thing to have you here. Can you hear me? There you go. Thank you for inviting me. Oh, God, yes. I invite you so. I, we try, we do try to connect. <laughs> and it just like whoosh, 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 all the time. So it's been just about a year since I was at Starseed. And I have mm -hmm. to say, it was an amazing experience. So. Uh, because you're from South Africa, yes, and yes, yes. You're, but you're in Byron Bay via London, I think. Um, what? Okay, how did you come across Starseed? How did you build it? What was your purpose? What's your aim now? 
And what is it? Okay, so unlike what many people may think, uh, it's not, the reference is not seeded from the stars, but more the return. So the idea is, you, you remember like in, I think it was in the 60s when there was a race to the moon, uh, there was a strange thing that happened. A whole bunch of nations all kind of competed in, in a positive sort of way instead of, you know, in a negative way, like, like preparing for war right. um, with a common goal. And, and now, now that goal in some sense is, is the race to Mars. But what will we do on Mars if we get to Mars, you know? Um, right. More importantly, the focus comes is if we were going to seed another system with life, what would we choose? What would be the best things, you know? Um, and of course, all our ancient lineages, all our ancestors, all the, the, the tribes who've lived close to the earth, they've been doing this for hundreds of thousands, if not millions of years, gathering the best soft technology, the best plants, the best fermentation techniques, dyeing. And because they were doing it, without like a modern type technology. Everything was biodegradable. Everything was renewable. Everything was adaptable and living. And therefore those systems were essentially perpetual and open. They were unlimited. And so if we were to seed another system, we'd want to seed it with life, not technology that needs constant maintenance, constant readjusting, constant updating, because that's such a drain on the resource. We want to be able to literally take a seed to seed a star, because within that seed is already the whole forest. In that seed is the unlimited potential. In that seed is not only the directions of how the tree needs to unfold, but how to adapt to a changing climate, how to produce more of itself. And so what we would be delivering is an open, intelligent, adaptable living system. And so Starseed is kind of the, a gathering place of all of these kind of ancient wisdoms and technologies and working out how we can modernize them for a, a recolonization but at this time, it's, it's almost like a reversal. We're trying to recognize what's, what's essential for living systems to be harmonic, to be perpetual, to benefit all and to be abundant. Mm -hmm. And you know, this is of course a big dream, but it's not, it's not really out of the grasp. But this is what the whole of nature and all our ancestors did. Yeah, nothing's out of our grasp, Dan. Nothing, yeah. <laughs> absolutely nothing is out of our grasp. In fact, it's much closer to our capabilities than we know now. And I think that's really important. And I mean, break, getting our minds back around that kind of thing is really important, mm. which reminds me actually, I saw something that you did uh, last night that I hadn't seen before I watched your Ted talk. Oh, and okay. um, it's, a fa it's a fantastic bit. It really is. It told me so much about you, you know? Um, okay, I gotta do it. Stop the presses. What is the feather in your beard about, dude? Because my <laughs> by now my people are going, what is it? Tell me that first. Okay, so the, the feather, the feather is actually a South African bird. It's called a guinea fowl. Ah. Uh, it it's potentially um, a totem of mine. I but saw. what I really like about it is I'll put it closer to the camera. Maybe, maybe you could see. Yeah, it's beautiful. Oh, oh, it's exclamation points almost. Really? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, so, so what it is? This one's actually a flight feather, but because uh, they're ground birds, but they fly when they need to. Yeah. And the beauty is they they've got these white dots on a black background, kind of like a star field. Yeah. But uh, from a distance, it's a grey. So it's it's. It's a, it's a pattern that breaks up the actual shape and color, like a type of disruptive camouflage, which they need when they're in the South African bush, because there's probably everything wants to have a go at it. Yeah, I bet. Uh, but the reason I like it is because it's not white or black. It's kind of like this uh, nature's yin yang. Of, so it makes a gray and it makes a disruptive pattern 
in your mind yeah. and it yeah. allows you to blend in in a way if you look carefully it stands out but if you if you're not looking carefully it's a blend in and i think kind of we'll, we'll probably wind or meander back to that idea of essentially like a type of uh, spiritual trojan horse of how we need to uh, deal with um, this impending kind of oppressive system that we find ourselves in is yeah. not to oppose it because it's got all all the money all the guns all the resources um, right. you know it would be it would be fruitless but, right. but there's a clever David and Goliath process here where we can sneak under the radar join it and then take it take it apart from inside much like Neo Neo does when he's yeah you know, works out that he's part of the matrix and yeah. it's part of him yeah. I agree with you completely and it's taken me a while to get to that sort of understanding <laughs> as well that there's a certain way you have to bring material because people are conditioned to accept material in a certain way now mm -hmm. and then um and then convince show them why um certain things just aren't worth fighting anymore that you can acknowledge them you know because we're we're at the the next layer down which is understanding us in the picture and mm -hmm. And then we go from that to um, an act of will, which is really making, freeing ourselves and making ourselves sovereign. So mm -hmm. it's, I saw something the other day that I quite like. What was it? It was, um, some, I'm gonna paraphrase it. It was something like, don't beg the government, you know, freedom is not begging the government mm -hmm. to do something for you. Freedom is doing it and then daring them to stop you. Do you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. It's that sort of take, Absolutely. You know, it's, it's like uh, gov any, anywhere where we find we've given away our responsibility to do something, it creates right. uh, systems of dependence. And that, that's where our energy leaks. You know, yes. we, we luckily enough have this amazing piece of technology, each one of us, that is super disruptive. Uh, in a very interesting way. And that's, that's the heart. And it actually creates like this quantum field effect, this yeah. loving field yeah. that, that literally transmutes everything and anything. So actually creating resistance is a form of persistence. You, you end up supporting the very thing you're fighting against. So the yeah. beginning of that shift is when we accept things the way they are, that initiates a change. But when we cultivate gratitude for those things, it means not only do we accept them, but we recognize that they essentially providence, that they divinely orchestrated. And then as soon as that happens, we recognize that there's no separation. There's this divine harmonic moving through everything. And all we needed to do was to vibrationally meet that match. And that's what well, this kind yeah. of attitude of gratitude is about. You know? Hence, hence, Dan, why <laughs> there is such a, it's such a massive manipulation of frequency going on all the time. Sure. Because there, that's the opposite, trying to, trying to mess with our ability to, um, well, with our natural frequency and our ability to create the frequency period, end of story. But you know what I didn't do that I really want to do, because I don't know the answer to this yet, I want you to start at South Africa. Can you start at South Africa and then take me up to Starseed real quick? How did you get there? Or do you not want, do you want no, to, can you? No, no, that's easy. So I was born in South Africa during the apartheid era. I grew up, I love nature. My whole back garden was a menagerie. I had birds and tortoises and snakes and chameleons. And, you know, of course my mother was freaked out by creatures <laughs> all over the place. Um, but Johannesburg, uh, where I grew up, was actually a very violent city. Uh, one of the most violent cities on the planet at the time. Yeah. And, you know, it, it just didn't work for me at all. So that as soon as I could, I left for, um, for university in Cape Town, which was by the coast. And so in order to leave uh, Johannesburg, I had to do uh, a marine biology, a Bachelor of Science in Marine Biology and, you know, all the life sciences. So that was an excuse for me to say goodbye to uh, my mum and go, hey, I've got to go to the 
you know, the ocean. And of course, I, I spent that, that time at the university uh, windsurfing every day. And Oh my and God, luckily, you're so brave. You're so brave. I've seen the videos of the sharks in that area. Yeah, yeah. Well, when, oh you, when you're windsurfing, you're going fast, you know, and uh, <laughs> at least you've got a chance. And um, luckily I had like a type of, semi-photographic memory so before yeah. the end before each exam i just borrow a, a friend who had good handwriting file and read through the file and, and do the exams but what it made me realize is that university was just the same as school we were just feeding to yeah. our teachers and professors what yeah. they wanted to hear and it was just basically preparing people for for the workplace um, yeah. commercial research and right. it kind of took this thing out, you know, like it took away some of my passion for nature. Sure. Yeah. Um, I then moved to the UK for 10 years where I lived in London and I was in, involved in the music industry and music video and running around in that. It was summer of love club scene, rave scene, <laughs> festival scene. And, and that was great. And of course my, um, introduction into the world of plant medicine and psychoactive substances and uh, neuro-gnostics <clears throat> yeah and you know um instantly returned to the world of my childhood where i realized the way i was seeing the world back then was intact and living and then Go to you, really to, yeah to revisit that and see that everything was alive and conscious was was yep. pretty mind blowing, and then I started a water gardening company. So I was making ponds in London, and, yeah. and you know, very soon London became too much of a city for me, and I wanted to escape back to, you know, somewhere yeah. a little more like my childhood in Southern Africa. And so I ended up leaving and coming to Byron Bay, Australia, where I moved to the rainforest. And built a little I see. I house see. out of wood up there in the rainforest, trying to retreat in, in I guess like it in my uh, you could call it my my prepper phase in the. Um, ah uh, yeah. The, Are you still prepped? Thought, Are you still ready? Well, no, no. What <laughs> happened was I, th at that stage I thought there was an impending war. Bush had just you know gone back into Iraq and. Yeah. From what I thought was going so swimmingly, all sort of turned a bit dark. And then I thought, all right, I need to go and grow my own food and have my own water and hide out in the forest and do all that stuff, which I did. Yes. And from Still being valid. so efficient or yeah. independent, I recognized that, yeah. you know, if, if, if the shit hit the fan, uh, we need to actually, everyone needs to be on some level. Otherwise, it would just turn into a free for all. And so I thought, yeah maybe what needs to happen is this needs to be more shareable um and all this these ideas of how to live in harmony and sustainably uh, need to be a little more out in the open and of course byron bay was already a center for that byron bay was it was, okay yeah had they had an aquarius festival in the early 70s and a whole bunch of people from sydney had moved up here and thought wow this is great and stayed and so from the Aquarius Festival, you know, we, we had this whole counterculture and hippie culture in the hills here. And of course, this became then the birthplace um, of permaculture. And, you know, that's, that rapidly spread around the world. It was also happened to be the area where the first successful forest protest occurred. Wow. Yeah, and so there were a lot of seeds for the environmental movement um, happening here of, with a big cross crossing with California. And, you know, the, people got into growing their own food organically and building houses out of, you know, materials. Straw hills were, and stuff, yeah. Yeah, you know, harmonic habitation. Mm -hmm. and, and, you know, so for me, that was when I was looking for a place that was all really attractive because I wanted to move to a small place but that was still open-minded and cosmopolitan, not parochial. Right. And this was it. And I right. arrived here, it was like coming home. I was like, wow. And the interesting thing was all the plants that I was growing in was when I lived in London. Yeah. You know, I had palms and ferns. They happened to be the same palms and ferns that were growing 
in the rainforest here. So it was literally like stepping into a dream. I bet. And, and yeah, it was mind blowing. And um, it, like I said, it was like coming home. And so then uh, I established in, um, in early, around about 2004, uh, in, a, in I guess what you could call a, a vision, I was flown over a piece of land and said, you know, go, go there and, and that's a good place to, to start a garden and to set up, a, I guess, like an earth school. And right. so that was the birth of Starseed Gardens. I, found, I went in, in the flesh then to find this piece of property. Um, it had been in the hands of some pig, pig farmers for three generations. Which is great. And they right. fantastic. just got to the point where they said, look, you know, we, we're done, we're selling. And I turned up and said, look, uh, I'd like to grow some gardens here. And they yeah. were like, great, because they didn't want their essentially ancestral lands to be turned into subdivision. Right. And so they gave me an option to buy. I didn't have any money. I ran around looking for money. And on the, the final hour, I managed to do some deal with someone and, and I borrowed the money to, <laughs> to buy the land. And that was the birth of Stasi Gardens, which is now 12, 13 years later, you know, beautiful, lush. It is. I've been garden. there, everybody. Yeah. And <laughs> fantastic. the idea is to teach how to grow your own food, how to grow your own medicine, how to grow your own fuel and fiber and building material, how to literally yeah. grow your own economy and yes. grow whatever it is we need. And that today there's, you know, that that's easy in a sense. The hardest part is actually the social permaculture, you know, people getting always, people. always. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Comparatively, yes, that is absolutely the hardest part. But being sovereign is, you know, this this everything about being sovereign is is a, is what we should be about right now. Sure. And that's if we need to we need to focus on that. We need to focus on that, and then you. Anyway, I want to ask you about you, so I don't want to get started. Um, I some of the stuff I want I, that I want to talk to you about that I came across last night. I was absolutely, I was just so blown away by this question that you ask your audience about who's, is there anybody in the audience who's indigenous or who's, yeah. okay, because you got me on that one for sure. You got everybody on that one, didn't you? Yeah. Probably yeah. Not. Yeah, because what they thought you meant, because you were in Byron when you filmed this, they thought you yeah. meant, yeah. did they have some aboriginal blood in, mm -hmm. in, in them? But that's not what Dan meant. Dan, can you talk about that particular clipping of the thought? Yeah, so, so this is part of, um, you know, I guess you could call it Agenda 21. Uh, when, when I was a kid growing up, I remember hating humans because I love nature so much. And it, they were showing people cutting down the rainforest and polluting the land and destroying the oceans and whaling you know and as a little kid who loved nature i just thought that was abhorrent but that was part of the plan is was to kind of pitch this idea of moving people into these encampments these cities and creating national parks which excluded humans and you've got to remember every landscape on the planet has evolved with human interaction whether they're the great plains or right the, the outback humans in harmony have been custodians and have looked after these places sometimes better than worse but it's it's quite a modern colonial idea of humans being bad for the landscape that this is a modern industrial colonial mindset right so you know f for me it was it was really looking down the barrel of how do we reverse that energetically how do we take this idea that we disconnected and reconnected. So the first, one of the first big splits along with all the other isms, racism, sexism, uh, you know, was, was this idea of people who were indigenous that they'd been there before. And then the, these other colonists, like where had they come from? You know, what planet? You know, so, so many times people are thinking we're, 
we're not indigenous. Those other people, the old world living in harmony with the land are indigenous. What does that make us? So when I ask the question, who's indigenous, what I'm really <laughs> looking for people to, to go into is the idea of, of course we're all indigenous. We come from the planet. It's just because we disconnected and we've, our minds have been colonized, we right. see ourselves as separate. Yes. And there was a beautiful story told by um, Bill McDonough, I believe it was. And he said there was some scientists at a conference and they were just uh, working out about plutonium burial. This is, you know, one of the most toxic substances on the planet. And they, they were trying to work out a glyph that was translinguistic so that people in the future would know not to dig at that place because beneath the ground there was plutonium. Mm -hmm. And at the lunchtime of the conference, there happened to be a First Nation American group uh, at the same campus having another sort of conference. So the scientists said to them, you know, what would you do? You know, and, and these, these guys turned around to them and said, don't worry, we'll tell them. In other words, we're not going anywhere. Right. Whereas the mindset of the scientists was leaving. Like, we're not going to be here anymore. So we need to create uh, this, this idea so someone else coming and colonizing the planet will know not to dig here. They were going, hold on, we ain't going anywhere. In your right. mind, you're all leaving. Yeah. And this is, this is the colonized mind that yes. is, you could call it a psychic parasite, but this is what we've all been infected with. Exactly. And, um, you know, the work of John Lamb Lash, uh, his book, uh, not, in, not In His Image, mm -hmm. talks a little bit about the, the you know, these, the, the Nagamari tests. Mm -hmm. and exactly. And the Gnostic texts, which yeah. your audience may be familiar with. But some, the some of them will be, yeah. Yeah, the importance of this today is literally that um, as soon as we went into this idea of monotheism, this forgetting that the earth itself was the goddess, Sophia, and that was sacred, as soon as we just started to worship uh, a, a wrathful male sky deity called right. Yahweh, right. Um, you know, and we have the birth of Judaism and Christianity and Islam, right. um, these religions literally uh, forced a type of colonization of the mind to forget that the land was sacred. It allowed us to lay waste to the forests and natural habitat because there was an, an afterlife, a heaven we would be going to. As long as we uh, played the right computer game, which, you know, in Islam, it's bow down five times a day to this. And if you're Jewish, you know, it's mm -hmm. grow this like mm -hmm. this and do mm -hmm. this and say this at this mm -hmm. time. And so what we find out is that these religions are like a type of, you know, um, I think uh, the guy who wrote *Sapiens*, Yuval, he talks a bit about it. It's it's like a, it's like a computer overlay. Um, it's to, so we're caught up in a type of computer game yes. where we uh, where we we look at our world through the lens of my, maybe either statism or religion. And then we play the game, and if we play the game right, we get the points, which is exactly insane. When you think about it, you're like, well, yeah, how based did on the premise that this situation, mm -hmm. you know? based on the premise uh, that someone else owns this planet, in this case, it would be Yahweh, and that we're just here by mm -hmm. His permission if we're good. That kind of stuff really That's separates right. us from. Yes, thank you. That's brilliant. You know, I'm going to have to incorporate some of this in my thinking and writing. Um, I will um, make sure that you get the reference for this stuff, but I'm just warning you that there's a lot of, well, I'm not warning you. I'm saying to you that there's some amazing stuff here that's causing my thinking to be enhanced and deepened and changed. And when that happens, I always like to credit the people who do that for me. Do you know what I mean? Um, anyway, absolutely. absolutely. Well, so just, just to finish that point. Oh, go uh, ahead. Sorry. Most people that the best kind of reference of, and I've, I've been doing a series of talks uh, called um, Our Most Precious Resource, which focus on human attention and human awareness. Yes. You know, and of course, because 
that awareness as a type of conscious excretion literally can create whole worlds. Of, of course, it's so precious. And of course, that, then the biggest game is how to steal or take our attention and divert it and use it to create other people's worlds, whether it's Absolutely. Facebook and social media or, or corporations. And so uh, I use the example of that, that kid's movie or kid adult movie, Monsters, Inc. Yeah. And for those of you who haven't seen it, you know, it's about these beings in another dimension who have interdimensional doorways or gateways or portals and they enter our dimension and scare kids, give them nightmares and capture their screens and then use that energy to power their world. Boy, they told us the truth in that one, didn't they? <laughs> yeah. And then, and then of course, um, on this other world, the monsters, there's a, there's a revolution with the monsters because of um, one of the monsters falling for one of these young kids. And so through this act of love, the monsters then uh, break the racket in their world and realize that actually capturing laughter, human laughter is 10 times more powerful than human fear. And so they, they bump off the guy from the, or let's say they root out the guy from the power company in their realm. Yeah. He's controlling everything. And then they then form this alliance with, with this other world. Um, and then their job is to come and make kids laugh because the laughing powers the other world. And of course it powers this world too. And so this is, this is a very interesting and simplistic idea of the challenge we have um, with these interdimensional portals and these psychic parasites is yeah. how do we, how do we uh, entrap them in, in love so that they realize they are part of us and that the only way they will truly benefit is if we truly benefit. So it's kind of got to be this, this win-win situation. And at the moment, humans are caught up in the idea that it's us or them. And this is, you know, again, part of the colonial mindset. And it, there can only be one winner and one loser. And as if we're all one, you know, we're going to be the winner and loser. <laughs> right. Very okay. Um, listen, the other thing I want to talk to you about really quick before I forget came also from that TED talk. You talked about combing the hair in the mirror. Do you remember that? Sure, sure. Oh, do that one, please. So, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Just while I remember. Yeah. Um, there's, a, there's a trend here in the sovereignty movement to mm. call the people, the, the original people here of Australia, the originees and not aborigines. Because ab means not, so like abnormal. Okay, great. So Originals. original would be like not originally, which is part of the colonial undermining of, yes. of those original people. Yes. Um, so, and, and using the words is, is we've, got to, we've got to control the narrative by controlling the lexicon and defining the words we're going to be using and how we use it so that we can steer yeah. the narrative, otherwise it gets steered for us. So yeah, the idea of, go ahead. Sorry, the, the idea of 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 this mirror is is very interesting because mirrors were sacred to um, most of the our ancestral cultures. Um, for example, the Egyptians. You know, the the mirror was was very sacred, and the reason the mirror is sacred is because of the reflective nature and and all the sages and saints before us have come to the realization that the world um, is mirror-like and reflective, and it reflects the idea of who we think we are. So there's a saying in the Talmud, um, we do not see the world the way it is, we see it the way we are, you see? And so this idea is, if you looking at, imagine as a tool, you looking at a reflection in the mirror, if you woke up in the morning and your hair was out of place, would you comb the hair of your reflection? Of course not, because you know, no matter how long you comb, you, there would be no change. But if we comb our own hair, then of course the reflection changes. And so this, this from a spiritual point of view is really the idea that 
true change only really happens within us. Right. First. And right. then we see its reflection out there. And so there's no point in trying to fight a battle out there. The biggest battle is in here. And, and this has been the spiritual landscape, uh, you know, since our earliest writings, whether they Buddhist or pre-Buddhist, is, is this idea that, um, that all change starts or is initiated within. And, you know, this is uh, the, these ideas of these controlling mechanisms, which are stealing our attention, are mm -hmm. constantly trying to, Britannia is divide and conquer. You can't divide yeah. and conquer people unless they don't know who they are. Right. And so there's this constant idea of uh, disconnecting us from the idea of the reflection so that we then will see our brothers and sisters and animals and forests as separate. And it's through that separation that it enables us to wage war or to cut down the forest, which right. is of course insane when you think about it, but it can only happen to a disconnected uh, mind, a colonial, a colonized mind. A colonized mind. I think we should just continue to say that because you know what, saying a colonized mind and putting it together with the word colonial is not something that people have been doing at all yet, which means that, that they will actually hear that because it's a fresh, mm -hmm. it's a fresh way to say it. Things get sort of, um, when they get said so, a, a lot over a period of time, they empty themselves of their meaning for people in a way, do you know, because you just hear it too much. But this idea of the colonial and the colonized mind, I think is something very, very important. And, and it, needs to be, um, it needs to be kept at the forefront. Now, the one, one of the other things that I got from listening to your stuff recently was um, you realize, because I know you do, that one of the things that my, my old writing partner and I were working on was this idea that everyone really knows now that um, there are something like 24,000 units of biophotonic energy that go through, that go through the human body each and every day. Mm -hmm. And that part of, that's part of what makes us attractive to any, like Don Juan and the Castaneda stories, any, any entity that might feed off something that we produce, mm -hmm. whether it's a negative energy, a positive energy, in this case, biophotonic energy, and my, my wonderment was always, if, if this biophotonic energy is something that is desired by a parasitic type entity, why not just take it? But they take it after we've had it, after it goes through mm -hmm. us. We, we transform it in some way. And you were talking about, oh, this just made me feel so good. You were talking about how our transformation of this light, this biophotonic energy, actually we actually feed and correct me if i'm wrong but we actually feed the plants and things right. around us with this transformed energy that is that did i get that right yes yes so the idea is there's uh, humans can create um, different frequencies of energy and if you give out a lot of energy you you become drained because our part of this colonial mindset is is this idea of economics and uh, scarcity around limitation and if you've got a limited amount of energy and you give a lot away and you don't follow your own body's economy then you become depleted and you have to find it somewhere else and what our ancestors have told us is when we experience that lim that level of depletion that's when we um disease kind of takes over and it shows us where we're leaking energy now what happens is so humans humans emit uh this energy and it's it's been called orgone chi prana biophotons right it's the same stuff it's this living energy and we digest it from our landscape through all of our senses uh so for example what we see what we hear what we uh, smell what we breathe are all ways of us digesting our landscape this living light landscape um, eating happens to be the grossest but it's another way in which we 
um, digest energy. And of course, human body itself cannot digest food. Only microbes right. do. And so, right. you know, we, essentially we're maintaining an internal intestinal garden um, and feeding that. And that's then feeding us. And that, that's, that's another whole story we can get into. In the, it's in interesting the though. Yeah. Yeah. But um, uh, humans also have access to an unlimited um, and inexhaustible energy. And what, um, the best analogy for that is the sun. You yes. know, it doesn't matter how many solar panels we put on the planet or how many uh, forests we plant. So even though there's all those more, uh, as many absorptive um, solar surfaces, leaves and, and silicon crystals, it does not deplete the sun. The more we have, um, the sun, if anything, responds to that by being able to glow brighter. And this is a very interesting idea. And our ancestors explored this in the idea that the sun is literally the heart. Remember I was using that metaphor yeah. of the mirror? Well, when we see the sun, uh, the sun is, is the heart. And our heart, when it goes into a very specific quantum phase, which we call love, it's radiant and inexhaustible. Right. In other words, when you're in love, that energy transcends not only space and time, it doesn't matter how many other people are tapping into that love, it's inexhaustible. In other words, you do not, you do not diminish, you actually rise and so does everyone connected to that. And this is the, 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 the natural e economy of things, just like, you know, when we're at school, we learn one plus one equals two. But in nature, one can equal infinity. You know, if I have one lotus seed mm -hmm. and I plant that, I get a lotus plant that has a uh, hundred flowers and each one, you know, a thousand seeds. seeds. Yes, yes. And then each one of those seeds is another whole lotus plant. So one equals infinity. Right. But we weren't taught that at school. Same as if you have, let's say, a turtle. Mm -hmm. You've got one turtle. You cut it in half. You don't have two halves of a turtle. You put them back together. You don't have one turtle anymore. You see? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, yeah. so we, uh, the mathematics we were taught was for this economic system yes. of dependence where, where one system increases and the other has to automatically deplete. Whereas the living natural systems of pure energy on, uh, that are built on love or this infinite energy are not of that ilk. Right. And therefore, um, because we have a generator within our chest, each one of us, which is called the human heart, we yeah. truly create a biophotonic field that if we're in love is literally inexhaustible. I mean, you yeah. think about it just from a, from a, uh, an organ point of view, the, the heart starts when you like, I think it's 32 cells. You know, yeah. you, you start uh, the mitosis process of the egg and sperm fertilization, and then you get mitosis, you get two cells, four, eight, 16, 32, 64. Round about that, it, you get what's called a, a blastula, and then it, it, it becomes a donut. And then at that point, all the cells synchronize and start to pump together. And so that becomes the central nervous system, but it becomes the heart. So first and foremost, the first thing we are as an organism is a human heart. A heart with a beat, which is music. A heart with a beat. And so <laughs> then that goes all the way till our last breath. You yes. know? So that, that inexhaustibleness is, in our, is hardwired into our natural world. Right. And so this heart, this heart, you know, there've been beings or maybe not on the planet like Christ beings and saints and Buddhas and the way in which they portrayed in the artwork of this radiance. This, I believe, is beings who have worked out that love is the natural phase of humanity when they are being like a sun, a radiant being. Mm -hmm. And then other beings that come into their field may go through spontaneous awakening or spontaneous healing, but their systems literally fed without diminishing of that other being system. 
And so the idea is that the human body, when it operates correctly, is a field broadcaster and generator. It's uh, living energies flowing through it, and then it puts its own spin or flavor, and then it then radiates, and every plant, every animal, every other human we come into contact with, the whole planet is then part of that feeding system. You know, and so then humans yes. on the surface of the planet become part of its nervous system, part of its energy system, mm -hmm. and part of its awareness. That thin film of life sure. becomes yeah. the meme brain or the membrane. Mm -hmm. And then all the membranes, whether it's around your cell or around the earth itself, mm -hmm. is where all the intelligence and consciousness and living energy, that's the, the hotspot for this biophotonic energy. Now, what, what uh, parasites don't understand is, and humans don't understand, is that parasites are only parasites because they're forced into that situation. If humans uh, create enough energy by being in love, then parasites' terrain changes and they go from parasites into symbiotes. And so if we're looking at tissue cells or cancerous cells or cells in the body that have gone rogue or become pathogenic, when we change the terrain, the, they often then can switch from being pathogenic um, into beneficial. And this, I think yeah. this is one of the most important uh, this modern rediscoveries in medicine is that the war against what we call pathogens through antibiotics is is impossible to win. It's like fighting ourselves. Oh, absolutely, absolutely. We, we, we are, um, for every trillion cells we have in our body, there are 10 trillion other beings, bacteria, viruses, fungi, phages, you know? And so yeah. if, if you look at that genetically, because the mitochondria, the powerhouse of the cell, is itself bacterial in origin. Mm -hmm. um, by genetics, we are less than 1% human by genetics. Wow. Okay. Now, this, there's <laughs> two directions that this yeah. makes me want. I want to go in both directions. So I can't yeah. forget. I can't forget. First of all, you tend to know more about chemtrailing than I do, which I love. Right. I, I, that just blows me away. The effects of those kinds of things. Dan's given me some hence really he hasn't given me like uh, volumes of information he just kind of throws a hint out at me to take so that i'll go off in a in a direction that might be fruitful which i love about you that you do that um so and then the other thing the other thing goes to this internal because help me remember this it goes to this internal um colony inside us that you talked about the food feed. Mm -hmm. okay but the first question i want to ask you is then going to this idea of parasites as well because because the first thing that the first thing that got me on this path in any way shape or form was a clear esoteric crime that was being committed by getting between us and the sun and not mm -hmm. understanding why anybody would would need to get between us and the sun what was the agenda there? What were they trying to achieve? So you've talked a lot about a lot about that relationship, that yes. real spiritual relationship between us and the sun. What do you think about that? What do, do you have some thoughts about why what the, yeah. what entity is doing that? Why? Well, first of all, let's let's just um, touch on what the sun is and our modern understanding of the sun, the modern scientific understanding of the sun is that it's a glowing ball, a thermonuclear yeah. explosion. Yeah. Um, and, and I think we'll find that this is uh, maybe true on just one dimension, but it's very naive. Um, the sun is more likely uh, a plasmic reaction uh, spinning a, a dynamo spinning in a plasma and it's it's light is more on an electromagnetic effect mm -hmm. and it's uh its relationship to the earth is is much more like lovers um you know mm -hmm. when your lover walks into the room you may blush and heat up uh at the sight of 
him or her. Mm -hmm. um, they heating you up directly, but it's 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 uh, it's by your your own internal heat in relation to them. It's not their heat that's heating you. Right. Um, and I You've think it's important something. to understand. Yeah. The other thing is that our sun. We've been told that light moves at uh, I can't remember three hundred and sixty-eight thousand miles, miles per second, yeah. per second or something, yeah, whatever yeah, yeah. it is, very Speed fast. Light. Yeah. Um, and yet we know that consciousness, which is a form of light, moves infinitely fast across space-time. In other words, space-time collapses. Mm -hmm. And so my understanding is our sun is like a local ISP. It is digesting the light of all the suns, all the great central sun, uh, you know, all come through and tell, sing the song, you know, their solar sonic song of what is happening in those dimensions, in those galaxies, in those worlds, mm -hmm. all gets digested and comes through our sun to our planet instantaneously. So when we experiencing the sun on our skin or in our eyes, we experiencing the living library of life through this photonic or uh, tronic energy instantaneously. Um, so our relationship to light, uh, everything on, on earth is built out of light, utilizes light, and you could actually measure that as a, a level of biologics, a biological success is how well a system or beings capture and utilize light, whether they're humans, whether they soil, whether it's forests. Okay. Mm -hmm. So now something we know from modern science is if you want to block that light, you can use metal oxides like titanium dioxide or zinc right. oxide. Right. Put that I'll on your them. skin and it will block the sunlight. Yeah. You know, if, if you happen to spray these metallic particles in, in the skies, then it's going to block certain spectrum of sunlight. So we all know about absorption spectrums and, you know, you get a mass spectrometer, and you heat up your, your sample, let's say a metal, and as it burns, it emits a signal, and you can tell by the, the bandwidth of what's absorbed, um, what elements are in there. So metals in, sprayed into the sky, aluminiums, barium, strontiums, they will be absorbing very specific parts of that light spectrum. Mm -hmm. So now imagine coming through our sun is, uh, the operating system, the upgrading of our applications, of our software and our operating system. There's, there's a massive shift that's happening, um, you know, in our solar system and in our galaxy of a quickening, of an upgrading of energy, of a new operating system coming in. And so anyone who wanted to maintain control would want to regulate the speed at which people awoke because if they, if they wake up too quickly, you lose control. People become autonomous, uh, right. people become sovereign, and people look at those control systems and go, what have we been doing? Yeah. And so, you know, if you want to look at it on a big, a big picture yeah. uh, type of view, you could say that the microbes that I was talking about earlier, um, they are form cloud-like intelligence of the planet uh, in the atmosphere, in our oceans, in our rivers, in our forests, in our soils, in our bodies. There's one living field of microbes that are so small and yet they're intelligent because they're one system. And they're very, very difficult to crack. This is the Earth's immune system and defense system, much like your bodies. In other words, if you've got something that's evolving every 20 minutes, like a bacteria, it's very difficult to cryptographically crack that code because it's constantly rolling and it's constantly changing. And this is what the story, the, the War of the Worlds was about, where these Martians arrive and they've got all this very high-tech machinery and the best of what human has in terms of military can't destroy them and yet mm -hmm. they become they be they overcome by bacteria 
This is literally the living um, immune system of our planet. But the bacteria in the body form three, you could even say four vital functions, and they form those same functions for the planet. The first is, and I've already mentioned, they digest the food. In other words, when sunlight hits a leaf or the surface of a plant, um, there's bacteria in that plant which have infused into the cellular tissue. They're called chloroplasts. And through what we call photosynthesis, through almost, uh, I think it's 100% efficiency uh, and superimposition, those chloroplasts can extract light to 100% efficiency. That's incredible. Mm -hmm. So then they capture that light and they store that <coughs> in a sugar battery. And then they trade some of those sugars with the soil microbes and fungi, in ex which will then trade them with, with amino acids and nitrogen to build proteins. But essentially, they, when they're making food, which is stored in these sugar batteries, these carbohydrates, these oils, and these proteins, um, we then feed those to our gut microbes, which then digest them. And then when they move through the blood, our cells then pull them into the cells, and it's the mitochondria, which is also bacterial in origin, which then cracks open the ATP and releases that prana mm -hmm. or that biophoton or that sunlight in the cell. And so what we have is uh, bacteria on both sides of that metabolic pathway. One is capturing light and storing it in a, in a little package, and on the other side is releasing light. And then the body utilizes that energy, that chi, that prana, that organ, mm -hmm. that biophotonic mm -hmm. energy to then drive its living system. And so if it has enough light or energy, then it fires up its immune system. So the, um, the bacteria create immune chemicals in the gut. So not only do they form a, perform this vital process of digestion, they also uh, produce the immune system chemicals of the body. Okay. They also produce <laughs> the neurochemistry. So depending on the quality of the food that we feed them, depends on the immune system chemicals and the neurochemistry they produce. Yeah. Brilliant. So having said yeah. all of that, <laughs> yeah. let me just say, let me just put out a, a, my postulate and you help help. Let's walk through it with, from your angle, from your point of view. Okay. Because it, it, it could answer one of the primary mm -hmm. questions that I always get asked after I make these statements. My feeling is that what we put in our bodies keeps us attached to the earth in ways we're not supposed to be attached to it. My feeling mm -hmm. is that food, food is one of the greatest cons that's ever been hoisted on the, our, us as beings. And that this is where people start to argue with me, but that I, I feel like we can live on the biophotonic energy alone, that technically mm -hmm. that's what we're doing is is just filtering that and bringing it and transforming that and bringing that to the planet. Having said that though, people always ask me, well, then what are your intestines? What are your all, what is all that for? So perhaps what you're saying is that that colony that lives in there is necessary to transform the light. Yes. Yeah. I, I I can definitely elaborate on that because that's, I guess that's the, the field of my research. Mm, um, but just to finish the last thought off, which was about <clears throat> the control or the regulation of this light through things like uh, geoengineering. Um, if you imagine that the bacterial fields of which mm -hmm. our body is part and all living systems are part, are the immune system, are the intelligence are the consciousness of the planet, then if you wanted to take over a planet, you would have to disrupt those systems. So with then, if you put that in pers perspective and you look at GMO and fracking and antibiotics and chemtrails, as you look at it as, as a full spectrum attack, they mm -hmm. literally would be attacking the microbiomes of the atmosphere, the oceans, the forests, and human microbiomes. So 
big pharma and big agricultural systems, then you see that uh, it, it's, it's a full spectrum so-called attack. But to what end? Okay, that's, that's the first thing. Now, um, the question that you, you get asked is why? And, and, and it's a very good question. The idea is that the human being is addicted to food. Yes. Um, we, the reason for eating is uh, primarily is to biosynthesize our landscape, is in order to maintain the body in its most current updated software and hardware form. So let me put that in perspective. Um, my mother, um, when she was being born, she already had all the ovum in right. her uterus. Right. And so she was being born and there were three generations right there. Um, of, of right. beings and so they fold out of each other one to the next so so the the cells from my mother come from an unbroken cellular lineage billions of years old yes they are the survivors of the survivors of the survivors they are super intelligent and they've formed these alliances with these microbes in fact you could say the microbes have structured the body just like they structured a tree and a tree is like a solar panel and, and the body is like a way of distributing the energy. It, and so my, not one person in my father's lineage died before procreating and not one person in my mother's lineage. So two multi-billion year old cellular lineages. So the body is super intelligent, but the way the body interacts with the rest of life is this digestion process. Is it eats this and it eats that. Okay, now the best example I could give you for you would be, let's say, a cow. Okay, so I heard this YouTube video of this Indian guy who was collecting uh, breeds of, of cattle, Indian traditional breeds of cattle, and he was explaining, oh, well, in, in India, the cows just roam free, and he said, and, and this cow here, it, it will go and it will browse and graze up to 60 different medicinal plants in a day. Yeah. And then in, in that day, it will then digest that plant in those four stomachs. Now, let, let's put this, let's kind of plug a, a kind of a spiritual overlay. The hooves of that cow, that keratin, is like a hair. It's a silica, compressed silica. So it's got four crystals that are plugged into the earth directly and separated by a very specific amount. And so it creates like a, a field effect, an electromagnetic field effect between the earth and itself. Then it's got another two crystals that are plugged into the cosmos, which we call horns, which create yes. this, you know, biodynamics, horn silica, Mm -hmm. It creates this ringing of the, of the cosmos. So it has two crystals plugged into the cosmos, four crystals plugged into the earth. It's eating the landscape, all these medicinal herbs, and then it's digesting them in these four specialized stomach, stomachs with all these microbes. And then it's producing milk. And then the, the Indians, the Hindu Indians would, would take this milk and they'd take off the cream and they'd make butter and then they'd clarify that butter into a ghee. And then that ghee they would use to heal almost everything. And people would go, well, what, how do you heal with butter? It's not, that is a spagaric or a homeopathic of all the plants in that environment that have then uh, kind of been put together in an alchemical way by the microbes and these crystalline networks of the cow. And so then the cow becomes sacred because the cow is a very uh, efficient way of biosynthesizing the landscape and intuitively knowing which herbs, medicinal herbs to eat, when and how much. And then humans lock into that. And so humans as hunter-gatherers are doing the same thing. We're looking, we're hearing, we're eating, eating the landscape and digesting the landscape through our eyes, ears, nose, and mouth. Yeah. And so the body part of the human, the, our physical suit, this adaptable, 
seemingly immortal flesh suit is our interface into the physical world and yet we immortal spirit beings that have grown ourselves a body in order to have that interface so the eating part of humans is to digest in order to know and become not for nutrition that is afterwards that comes again from the colonized mind and that is we can eat food because we like to and because we want to remain connected but if we start to believe we have to now we're addicted to food that we relationship can. will become poisonous over time and we can see uh, people even health food people are, well it does this and then this does this and this does this so mm. yes my belief is that we can live off light directly and modern science has confirmed that now through photobiology but uh, switching we'd have to slowly wean yourself off food right because really what you're weaning yourself off is the belief system that the body requires food exactly. in order to survive Mm -hmm. so uh, and and don't get me wrong here um i love to eat oh, who and, does? <laughs> and, and as long as i don't you know you only need to go on a three or seven day fast to realize how much energy is liberated how much of our time as beings oh we god spend yes making money buying food cooking three meals cleaning up after three meals right uh, after our household our kitchen the gas, right. the refrigerator. In other words, a huge chunk of human energy is yes. just on food and the fear of scarcity that we go to war over that food. Yes. You could even say that the, the beginning of agriculture was the beginning of the yes. big genocides of uh, yeah. the connected ancient peoples of our planet, our ancestors, because as mm -hmm. soon as farming came in, it created mm -hmm. war because Agreed. of the pooling of of energy you know and saving of seeds and food hoarding and then of course when people are starving you know they, they'll feel like we need to go over and attack those that other tribe over there they've got all the food you see yes yes um and uh landlord uh means keeper of the grain and so the first landlords were the biggest baddest guys the biggest thugs and mm -hmm. warriors because they mm -hmm. needed to protect the granaries and right and it was from those landlords uh came what we call um the aristocracy so our aristoc aristocratic blood is from thugs mafiosa yes, of course of course you know so that's if, why we're in such a mess <laughs> if the if the food industry shall we say the food industry yep. If the food industry fell, every bad intention that's out there would fall, in my view, because mm -hmm. that's you're, you've just described. It's all built into this, the food con. It's all built into that that um, belief system that we're chained to when it comes mm -hmm. to food. So for me, this is a big part. I mean, I'm just now getting to the point where I have the liberty, the time to research this kind of thing as well. So I hope that you and I can have lots more conversations about this sure. i'm going to write about this as well so i'd love to have um you know tons of private conversations with you about it of course i want to have you back you know to talk about this because people are going to find this conversation fascinating they're going to know why i every once in a while start talking about dan schreiber and you know sure. uh, the conversation i never got to finish in byron bay which kind of reminds me there's two other things three two or three other things i don't want to forget you talk a lot about iron you talk a lot about iron and iron is hugely important. I found that in my chemtrail analysis and I found that in my mm -hmm. research on the FAG. Okay. And when I was in Australia, I was really lucky because I was really lucky because Dan saw both of my lectures and one of them had to do with chemtrails and the other one had to do with the face. So they were seemingly unrelated. But the one thing that he was able to do for me was draw this bridge, make this bridge. And it had to do with iron because I was talking mm -hmm. about iron in both of those lectures and I actually had not put those things together but one of the chemicals I was just saying that one of the chemicals that comes down is strontium and it's a bone marrow seeker which which means it's obviously after the iron in, in our blood the red blood cells and then I started talking about iron and its relationship to the fae 
I've recently been told, I've discovered that before the deluge, Ireland was known as Ironland, mm-hmm. which I think that's massively fascinating to me. So I, because I've seen you talk about iron again recently, do you want to say, can you say some things about that? Sure. sure. So, the difference between plant blood and human blood, or most mammalian blood, red blood and green blood, is one molecule. So the center of the the human blood is an iron molecule. And it's important because of the characteristics of iron. Um, And uh, in in the 60s and 70s, when I was growing up, music was recorded often on on tape and what tape is is a piece of cellophane uh, with rust on it and what is rust rust is 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 iron oxidized iron particles and the reason rust was used on that cellophane tape is because if you take a magnet a magnetic head and you put music through that magnet it will align the rust particles on the cellophane so much so when it goes over the playback head which is sensitive to the magnetic fields that those alignments of rust make the Mm -hmm. music then plays back now imagine your blood is is like that cellophane tape um and your organs are all like um you know, 48 track, uh, for those people who don't know what that is, it's it's a multi-track music recording system. And so what happens is um, the center of our blood and the blood molecule itself is donut in shape. So it's a torus shape, which is the energetic field around our body, around the planet, around our solar system, around the galaxy. Um, And that shape happens to be the most efficient shape to store energy, and what we call magnetic or memory. And so what happens is the blood is part of the living system that records as it flows through our body, um, the fields, the electromagnetic fields that we inhabit. And it also plays back. So each organ would be like a recording and playback head. So the kidneys may record the level of fear that we're feeling from our environment and and then play back the level of fear we have in relation to that into our blood that then goes into the urine that then gets peed out into the environment. Um, But so what it means is our blood is kind of like part of the living interface of living energy and it allows us to experience uh, what's coming in Mm-hmm. and then change that alchemically and then radiate something different going out. And so therefore the Chinese and the Greeks and all the great healing traditions would talk about the vitality of the blood is where all the immune system and life is. So if your blood stagnates, you start to dissipate energy and you become diseased. And if you've got vital blood, you can, it doesn't matter what is surrounding you in terms of bacteria or whatever uh, pathogens, you, you can just shed off. So the, the iron is also found, it's all through uh, planetary strata in the geology, um, and we call that ochre. And you look at every single tribe would use ochre ceremonially or they put it on themselves in ceremony. And what it does is it then amplifies that electromagnetic signal, whether you're picking up the sun or the earth or a tree or other people, putting ochre on your body then amplifies that signal. And you you could probably look at um, old photographs of originates from Australia, not only would they put ochre on, they'd take emu feathers and stick them along their nadis and meridians along the body and then go to a sacred site and then dance in a particular way on that site. And so what they're doing is they acting like a dynamo and then amplifying the feathers, the emu feathers that have the blood in them would be like a needle on a meter. So it would amplify the signal coming in and out. And so then when you look at all these rituals and ceremonies at certain times and in certain places, you realize what they're doing is a massive type of 
earth acupuncture through, and this was their custodial role to do fructifying ceremonies on the earth and keep it going perpetually forever. That was, that was their job. And that as was the job of humans on the planet all over the place until this psychic parasite, until this monotheism yeah. or, you know, this colonization of the mind. Yeah. And of course, the colonization happened first and foremost in, you know, in the church and in the crown and in the politics because they had to convince their people to go to these other places, whether it was the Amazon or Canada or South Africa or India or Australia and, and literally um, come into contact with way more advanced civilizations than themselves and yet believe that they were more advanced because right. of their technology, so much so that they would say, right. no, here's our holy book. Here's our technology. Here are our printing yeah. presses. You guys need to, you know, follow us because what we have is more advanced. And then you look back at modern history and you realize why the crown supported Darwin as opposed to Lama, why they liked the idea of survival of the fittest. Yeah. Why religion you know, would be going into places like the Amazon and bringing the church. And yet those missionaries would encounter groups of, of beings who are drinking jungle lianas and ayahuasca and being in touch with God directly as pure Gnostics. Right. And going, uh, you know, what are you bringing to us? This book and thing, show us how your lives are better. And of course they couldn't. And so right. then the wars ensued. You know, then, then the, the, the colonialism by violence. And that is still continuing today through it is. corporatism. It is, it well, as well as just flat out war, which is actually something I was going to, I was going to interject and ask you to see if there's, tell me what the connection is then or what your thoughts are about what you've been, what you've described as the abilities, the capacities, um, the magical nature of human blood, really. Um, what are these massive blood sacrifices about then? These huge wars? Great question. Okay, so the Maya shaman kings and queens um, recognized there was, ba this is real basic. So there was the underworld, there was the world which the body inhabited, and then there was the upper worlds. And they were constantly making sacrifices, energetic sacrifices to the upper world and the lower world to keep them pacified and keep everything in balance. And so when they wanted to um, energetically allow uh, disincarnate spirit beings to inhabit this world, to share with them wisdom, the shaman kings would, and queens would take blood from the tongue Mm. and from the penis or the vagina and put it on these strips of paper. And then uh, when they burnt those strips of paper, the smoke would, uh, the acidity would, would take their prayers and offerings to the upper worlds and the ashes would, would then pacify the lower worlds through that alkalinity. And so the offering of blood from the shaman kings and queens was to enable the spirit beings to have an interdimensional interface to this world so that they could speak just like gulliver's gulliver being able to access these other worlds these lilliputian worlds what, what we're talking about here is access so the blood then becomes um a way of an offering uh to enable other beings because it's the sharing of this uh like the rivers like the waters it's the the carrier of living energy and intelligence in the body mm -hmm. and therefore it's like the waters of the earth it, it's a living liquid crystal that carries the intelligence of all the great apu mountains and the springs as they flow down through the great rivers and fertilize um the great civilizations and then end up in the ocean and so there's one uh, water that touches all the mountains and and all these cultures and flows through all the forests and our body is the same so that blood is a representation of love consciousness of, of the whole human matrix let's say so then to take blood 
without consent, the blood sacrifice, that's then a, t a form of black magic to do yeah. other things. Yeah. Okay. So um, now we entered the world of, of transparency, magic, consent, law, uh, the loss of sovereignty. And so the great wars that continue are in a sense a form of um, a form of this war that's happening with the consciousness of the planet let's call it Sophia yes. the goddess yes, and that. <laughs> this parasitic uh, imposter uh, demigod who is trying to take over and is using blood as a way to bring uh, the living system to its knees. Yes. And, and oil and water and blood all have these beautiful synergies of the carriers of living energy on the planet. It's and so true. the blood then is, is very sacred to all our ancestors. Um, but the big difference then is the offering of blood or the taking of blood. So the Maya, the Maya God, uh, you know, shaman uh, kings and queens offering their blood is totally different to the later misinterpretation of the Aztecs and the church of them taking blood, you know, by human sacrifice. So it's a perversion. And the right. difference is the heart. Um, when, we, when, we truly, um, when we truly in love, then for us to give something that uh, of ourselves, like a blood sacrifice that's given freely is totally different. And that is like medicine. When it is taken, then it's a form of black magic. Indeed. And, and we're surrounded by same substance. What's that? Yeah. Well, we're surrounded by, well, we're surrounded by magic everywhere, all kinds, but certainly yeah. black magic is one of our problem is our, is our, I think primary problem. That's yeah. my view anyway. Uh, the more I'm learning about things like, um, I've recently, I've recently become convinced that the dumbing down of us in terms of our vocabulary, in terms of how we can use our voices, which is how, which is the end point of how we create its tone, its music, its notes, it's all that stuff that comes out of our mouth. The, this, this corralling of our vocabulary and making it very small is a way mm -hmm. of our being made to continually cast the spells that they want us to cast. Do you see what I'm sure. saying? So, so this this bit of control. Sorry, I'm interjecting this. You're probably not finished with your point, but um, I just wanted to underline this idea of the black magic that you're bringing, and everything's a gaming addiction as well. So, mm -hmm. anyway, please finish. I'm sorry about that. No, no, that's cool. So, the reason the Maya kings and queens, and remember, this is not the the average people so the the highest of the high were giving the blood mm -hmm. and the reason it was them giving the blood is because they were seen as uh the interface between the deities and the and the, and the the physical realm and so and the reason that was taken from the tongue and the penis is because these are the two creation points for the tongue and the vagina right um out of the giant vagina is birthed physical beings which are this continuation of this living matrix out of which the, the immortal spirit being grows itself a body to walk around in this realm and out of the tongue are the minds or the cosmic thoughts we have the dreaming that we then sing into existence exactly. and so this becomes the, the mode of creation what we say how we say it the tone the music that comes out is then also creative so these are the two ways that humans creatively emanate into this reality um, and that's why the spelling or the control of language is so important for the control of the belief system yeah. and so the mind uh, so it's important for us to look at lexicons um, take something like the Egyptians you know they they carved, uh, and, and the people who were carving that may have been, let's say, the Atlanteans for all we know. Um, they were carving hieroglyphs because hieroglyphs were translinguistic. They could transcend time. 
So if you've got a hawk flying, we know today if we see a hawk flying, they can flap their wings and stay in one place. So that becomes a symbol of levitation. So that, that transcends time because anyone in any time who knows a hawk can see that a hawk is capable of flying and staying still. Right. So to create a translinguistic language means that you're one step closer to telepathy where there is no possibility of misunderstanding. The more you right. go into the different languages, then we yeah. enter like the, the Tower of Babel where everyone's speaking a different language. Even people who speak English, you know, we have different understandings. So part of our job today is to create uh, new words and define their meaning. In other words, create a lack of our own lexicon. So we drive the narrative, not mainstream media or politicians or banks or big corporations, which hijack the words and then take them for themselves, whether it's green or uh, sustainable, or whatever it is they want to take over, mm -hmm. uh, to then corral and control people. We need to constantly reinvent words just like kids do on the street slang you know where mm -hmm. hot is cool and or whatever <laughs> um yeah. so they need to uh, we need to create the words define the words create our own lexicon drive the narrative and keep it moving so that these big systems cannot catch up and that's one of the things that social media has as a possible beneficial tool mm -hmm. is to constantly shift the playing field faster than uh, the parasite or AI can keep up with. True. And, and we are now. What's that? Let's go ahead. Yeah. So, so this, is, this is the challenge for the awakening consciousness is to stay ahead of the game by yeah. constantly reinterpreting um, and creating new linguistic uh, quagmires for people um, <laughs> who are attempting to take control. This is what the bacteria are doing. This is what the viruses are doing. Yeah. They are constantly oh, yeah, yeah. True. morphing so that when you, when you take an antibiotic and you kill off 99%, the 1% that survives already has the code and so by the time that breeds up all the new bacteria then are uh, you know undefeatable by that last antibiotic and not only that they then transmit that through the cosmos initially in their environs through uh, infrared but then ultimately through like a, a worldwide web so mm -hmm. that there are bacteria that are really upgraded with those antibiotic um, yes antibodies in the amazon even though they're, they're finding places that those antibiotics have never even been introduced there's already the bacterial microbiomes are already adapted to them so this gives you an yeah. idea very interesting isn't it uh -huh. how advanced the system is and the quicker we befriend this living cloud-like intelligence that is actually part of us yes and stop going to war with it the quicker we will become reconnected back into Sophia, the reawakening of Sophia, and then the quicker um, the plants, the planet's immune system and consciousness will then be indefeatable. And so each one of us, our job as curator, as custodian, as conductor, is literally to cultivate self-love, is to fire up that organ, that radiant light organ in our chest and radiate love. And this is really important because the difference between white and black magic that I've spoken about before is anytime we're sending energy outside of our body, it's a form of black magic, even if we're sending love. Yeah. Only way we are performing white magic is if we are drawing, like biosynthesizing our environment into ourselves. And then what naturally radiates from our heart is then in the perfect amount, in the perfect field for everyone and everything as they need it, the frequency we call love, that is white magic. Everything else is a form of gray or black magic. Even Agreed. if people are doing good. 
Agreed. Completely agreed. Now, there's one final question I have for you. Sure. <laughs> I've waited a year to ask you this question and be able to have you sitting in front of me so I could get the whole answer. When I, last I saw you in person, you said that there was a place near Starseed where time began or, or where time originates. I'm going to try to say yeah. it the way you say it. Not only did you say that in response to me saying that it had become immediately apparent to me in Byron Bay that time moved in a way that I'd never experienced before. And time shifting in my consciousness is not a new thing, but this particular way, this particular method I could see was, was very something I hadn't seen before. And Dan said, well, right over there is where time originates. And not only is it where time originates, but it's getting ready to restart. You so go. <laughs> On okay, that so the dreaming, the dreaming of of the eastern seaboard of Australia, and and with its focus actually as as Byron Bay, which is the most eastly point. Um, the dreaming from the people from the tribes here, they see Byron Bay as the the kind of cavern bar, which is the meeting place, and when certain stars would appear, all the tribes up and down the eastern seaboard would gather here for a big corroboree, which is like a powwow. Um, but uh, this, this eastern seaboard, this point that sticks out into the ocean is like the bow of a, a ship that is sailing through time, the ocean of time. And the belief was that the birth of time or this dreaming or this realm started here on the eastern seaboard. And the dreaming is that there's a particular mountain and a particular waterfall, which is um, the place of the birth of this dreaming. And the landscape is reflected in the star law. And so they look at the stars and then the stars then imprinted in the physical world, the landscape, and it then unfolds from here through uh, the rest of the landscape. Now, there was a guy who came to visit me must have been about 15 years ago, a guy called, I think, Carl Kellerman was writing a book on Mayan calendrics, and, and he was mapping regions um, with a, an exponential um, system, numbering system, which was mapped on the pyramids. And what, what, what they were saying was that the first base of the pyramid may take billions of years, the first time thing to unfold, and then the next one would be shorter, exponentially, exponentially, much like Terence McKenna's time wave theory that the 50% of the evolution of consciousness on the planet would maybe happen in the last millisecond, you know? Yeah, Such yeah. The, the speeding up, uh, which I think is called Boyle's Law, or something. Well, you know, today we're seeing it with with the exponential increase of um, computing capability, for example. Good analogy, yeah. So, so what happens is, according to them and, and me, <laughs> is that the birth starts here and it moves really, really slowly, but it moves in a line that's north to south. It's moving east to west. And so, um, Australia, the eastern seaboard, maybe China um, and, and Asia, there's this uh, amazing birth of civilizations and consciousness that's occurring. And then it moves across, picking up pace as it goes through, um, you know, the Middle East and then Europe. And then as it falls through, through Europe, you know, it starts to pick up pace and it's, it's now moving through you know Europe and Africa and then the whole colonization goes through and then it's picking up more pace and it hits the Americas. Now by the way due to when the earth was much smaller oceans don't count in this movement it's just the continents so then by the time um, you know you're getting the first people the Puritans hitting you know, this, this um, eastern seaboard of the United States now going at high speed and this colonization as it spreads across uh, North and South America. And by the time the, the 60s, 50s and 60s hit, it's hitting the, the western seaboards of the Americas. And what, what's going on in, in, the, in the northern hemisphere?
atmosphere, you have the birth of what we call silicon consciousness. Um, the, these two incredible, powerful memes happen. You have Gordon Wasson, uh, you know, and Timothy Leary bringing up magic mushrooms from Mexico and, and ayahuasca <laughs> and the Yahe letters. Mm -hmm. and, and you have the birth of silicon consciousness, the silicon chip, uh, whether it was come, come from Roswell or wherever, and all of a sudden, that birth of technology, modern technology, AI is born. And at the same time, on the Western seaboard, the earth is bristling its own reawakening through Washuma or San Pedro, ayahuasca and mushrooms. In other words, there's the natural organic plant medicine uh, building of a new neural network. And at mm -hmm. the same time, you have this neural network, which is this technological neural network. And then we're at that point in time where that's now spread. So now, you know, software yeah. is as likely to be produced in India or Ireland as it is in Silicon Valley. Right. Now we're at this final accelerated phase, which jumps across the Pacific back to the Eastern seaboard of Australia again, where it all starts. So this is where it collapses and is reborn. And this, um, the, each one of those movements is actually predicated or um, assimilated with what we call drugs as they move through, whether they tea or opium, uh, crack cocaine which its mirror-like aspect is is coca or pachamama you know the most one of the most sacred plants on the planet or tobacco which is one of the most sacred plants of the planet and then how this system turns that into the biggest poisons you know so there's this essentially like this war between ai and biological between the the colonialist consciousness and the earth biological consciousness and then it comes, it comes to this head in the uh, approach of third world thermonuclear war, AI, chemtrails, right. you know, total loss of control and imprisonment, you know, and at the same time, there's this birth, birthing of this green movement and awakening and consciousness and humans starting to like turn on and go, oh, that's what we are. That's what we're here for. And then, so the, the chemical or the neurochemistry at this time is what's called dimethyltryptamine mm -hmm. or DMT mm -hmm. and 5-MeO-DMT. <coughs> and what these endogenous brain chemicals do, they're not only endogenous in the human system, they're found throughout nature. So they're found in plants and in soil microbes and in animals. And the wonderful thing is that they serve the same purpose in humans as they do in the natural world. So dimethyltryptamine is one of our most powerful neurochemistry molecules. And it's literally like the hormone of life. It enables that biophotonic transfer between beings, between the sun and the human cellular tissue, between me and another human, between me and a plant. And so that light communication is modulated by something like dimethyltryptamine and its uh, sister is melatonin which is the hormone of darkness so the hormone of light is dimethyltryptamine and the hormone of darkness is melatonin and melatonin by the way on the skin is the way that our skin surface and the microbiome on our skin captures light directly on the surface of the skin and powers up the body so that's why when we're in the sun for a while, we get a tan and our melanin builds up our capacity to absorb light directly through our skin as well as through our eyes, sun gazing, etc. So Dan, I'm sorry, I'm gonna um, have to I'm gonna have to stop the meeting because of my my computer's acting funny. Say one more thing really quick and then I'm gonna end it so I can get the recording. What would you wrap okay, that up so, with that bit? Okay, so the then as it jumps across we have the collapse of time the end of this whole realm uh -huh. and then the birth of a new one which is starting again it, it's imminent maybe it's five years maybe it's 10 years maybe it's one week but in the next very short while all the prophecies whether it's the hopi prophecies whether it's the vedic prophecies uh, you know the, the false start of 2012 or maybe it wasn't 
but all, that timeline, that collapse of all the timelines down to the singular singularity point of consciousness and then the birth of a new world is right. all what we're witness to right now. And each Fantastic. one of us plays a role um, with our own hearts. And maybe I'll leave it till next time, the story of this yes. mountain. That okay, I want you to come back. The mountain of the Hopi and, yeah. and, 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 and its relation to the myth of the Thunderbird and yes, these please. reptilian beings and 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 the parasites and what what's happening with this matrix right here in byron bay yeah i want you to we're going to schedule a meeting i'm going to get on facebook with you that there it goes okay i'm going to end the meeting now so i can make sure i save this tape and go get my my power source and see if that's the issue okay. and then have you come back yes please okay fantastic fantastic, love fantastic conversation see this is Thank what happens so when we talk it's fabulous yeah, yeah. Okay, bud, I'm going to end it now. Bye. Okay, thanks.